So we're Chef Staz now, starting the culinary project. Chef Staz, say hello. Okay, hello everyone again. I would like to start our part of the culinary project. And our part is called uh, artisan food and kitchen equipment, kitchen uh, technologies that are involved in it. And I would like to start with a presentation that uh, I will broadcast on the screen. So, um, let me come present it. And uh, I'm sorry, share this one. Going to here, slideshow from beginning. Okay, so I believe it should be visible. So our topic is artisan food and kitchen equipment, kitchen technologies. And me and Chef Yu, the next uh, few days, we will talk about artisan food today, what it is, uh, what are different options of artisan food that you can make, what are the benefits of it, the equipment that you will need. Also, we'll show you the recipe today we're making the traditional Bulgarian bread called Pogacha. And uh, the other two days we'll talk about industrial food, how it came up, uh, what are the benefits of industrial food, and then on the third day, the pros and cons of industrial food and artisan food, where it's better to use one and where it's better to use the other one, and which uh, kitchen equipment you might need. And we'll show you a few more recipes, uh, show you today, tomorrow, and uh, the day after, recipes of artisan food that you can make by yourself. So let's move on with the presentation. There is much more information in the notes if you uh, download it and you can learn more. But basically I will go fast now talking about first the term. The artisan is the term it's used to describe food that has been done by non-industrial non methods. Uh, what does it mean? It means basically that it was done without complex machines, preferably by hand and by traditional methods that are polished down through generations. And now even some of them can be in danger of being lost. Uh, characteristics of artisan food, yeah, because the word artisan it can be a bit confusing. There is art part in the beginning, and some people think artisan means it's uh, always um, artistic. And in some way, yeah, there is no real definition of what is art and what is craft. And from my point of view, uh, food that is done in artisan way is for sure artistic enough and it's really beautiful. So it has to be made by hand or by simple machines, let's say, made by traditional methods, made with traditional tools, uh, not mass produced, often produced over a long period of time and cannot be uh, forced to the extra chemicals or uh, uh, complex machines and consumed relatively close to where it was created. In traditional artisan food, it was done in this town, and products can be only sold to the people in this town, yeah, because you, cannot, you don't have means to, to transport it to another city, another country, just uh, because it was lack of machines, lack of technology for doing that. Okay, uh, another problem with artisan food now, that artisan becomes uh, a marketing trap. And now, uh, mark, uh, market, marketing managers of many companies, they want to use some nice words like gourmet, like premium, like artisan, uh, organic, stuff like this, to make their products stand out, to make it look better, make it look more beautiful, more appealing to the customer. Uh, and it becomes a very, uh, such a big confusion for customer to distinguish where it's a marketing label and where is the real deal. So how we can decide that? There is a group uh, called Harman Group. It's a consumer culture consultancy with a long history. And uh, they suggest asking three main questions for the product. Uh, first one is, does a real person have this product look here? Yeah, or it was done by machines. The second, is it made by hand in small batches or limited quantities using specialty ingredients? And the last one, does it reflect expertise, tradition, passion, process? So if any of these questions, uh, you will answer for a certain product. And probably Can you get this? Probably it's a dozen. And, we'll very fine. and uh, describing more artisan food, we have to jump in a little bit of history. And uh, if we go to, to 200,000 till 10,000 years ago, 
Well, the first humans, uh, Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, they um, appear. They got their food mostly by gathering and hunting. This was two main ways to get the food. And uh, at that time, their diet was quite good because uh, of the food variety. You can gather a lot of different mushrooms, berries, uh, different leaves, different uh, vegetables and fruits. And you can hunt many different animals or fishes or other seafood. So the diet was good. But also it was very unpredictable. Yeah? If you find um, some tribe of deers and uh, then you spook them off and they run away, then you're hungry and you probably die. If you eat some foreign fruit and it's poisonous, you probably die. And also all the time you have to travel. Yeah, you cannot sit in one place because animals go away from you. You eat all the berries that you have in vicinity and you have to leave. So the problem of this time that people cannot grow uh, they cannot have bigger villages, they cannot have bigger tribes because all the kids and all the uh, old people you, you kind of have to leave them behind or you have to carry them and this makes you weaker. So at that time two main foods they had was the meat and some vegetables and even from that time uh, humanity started to learn these two artisan ways of uh, cooking food. This one is the dehydration because okay, you kill a big mama, and you have a lot of meat. But if you do, if you don't do anything with it, it's gonna spoil, and then you just uh, have to throw it and hunt again. And maybe you spend a lot of time or, or some human sacrifices to get this uh, animal down. So you have to preserve the meat somehow. Yeah. So one of the simplest way is to dehydrate it by hot sun or hot stones that you warmed up in the oven some way of dehydration. And another thing is butchery. Yeah? You kill the animal, you have to learn how to, if you kill a big mammoth somewhere far away from your camp, you have to bring it. Yeah? And bringing the whole big animal, it's difficult. So you have to cut it into pieces. It's more convenient for you to bring. Or maybe you can even take it with you when you leave this place and you go for the next one. So butchery was also extremely important at that time. And uh, Artisan butchery is now a, a big thing and many people go for it because um, uh, you can get unusual cuts that you normally won't be able to find in the shop. So by learning artisan butchery you can uh, learn some new pieces of meat, new cuts of meat and the ways of using them and they're maybe even more tasty and better for you. Uh, you can cook them different way and can learn something from this. And also, knowing and using these unusual parts will make you stand out as a unique professional. And so artisan butcher is one of the directions that you can go by learning it. And many restaurants in the world, for example, I know about uh, Chicago's The Purple Pig, uh, they, they try to use nose to tail um, animals that they buy. You can buy the whole pork, for example, the whole pig, and use everything. Use pork liver for pate, use um, beef tendon, to make the chips with salt and vinegar, can use uh, pork rillons, uh, which are the cubes of roasted pork belly, in another dish. Many, many restaurants, if they have uh, enough space and they have professional, they can, and they're meat oriented, let's say, they can use this artisan butchery skills to make it really good and make it more interesting for the customers. Because yeah? anywhere you go, can find uh, tenderloin steak or t-bone steak or the classic steaks but it's not very often you can find a skirt steak or you can find uh, um, some other tasty things or like beef tongue for example so another part what you can get from the animal if you know how to butcher it properly it's the offals or innards and in some countries it's more popular, like here in Bulgaria or in Russia, we love beef tongue and, or veal tongue uh, or pork tongues and lamb and tongues cheeks. also. Cheeks, yeah, many other parts uh, because they're really tasty. If you know how to cook them and you cook them properly, they're really tasty. So the tongue itself, it's uh, underlying muscle, it's fairly tough, but if you cooking it slowly at low temperatures for a long time, it, uh, all of this uh, connective tissue, it melts, it creates a lot of collagen uh, that will be turned into gelatin and this becomes really tender uh, and juicy and very tasty. So 
one of the dishes that, that's, uh, sorry for the picture on the left, uh, it's one of the dishes that we made a few years ago, a uh, bit of like Massimo Batura style, it was some uh, barbecue spice sauce, uh, cooked and then <clears throat> sautéed beef tongue and um, uh, parsnip puree with the parsnip chips. It's one of the dishes that you can have in the restaurant, can amuse your guests, because I know in many uh, European countries, Opals are not so famous. <clears throat> Another ingredient, uh, very classic, it used in many, is used in many countries and can you can use it also, is the stomach and intestines. And with the intestines you can make the different sausages, different uh, stuffings, and with the stomach there are traditional dishes in many countries. For example, in Mexico they have a menudo, uh, Chinese use it for the dim sum and, or for the salad, Vietnamese pho soup, they can also use stomach. And here in Bulgaria there is an amazing soup called Shkembecher Ba, which is the soup with the tripe, with the uh, cow stomach. And uh, it is uh, like a hangover soup, it gives you, or if you're sick, gives you a lot of strength, a lot of uh, health, a lot of energy. And usually, traditionally, you serve it with uh, some garlic oil and some chili flakes, so you can make it more spicy if you want to. And uh, for, for the bouillon, it's used even the, the cow feet, so it's even okay. more utilizing. And, and the stock, the bouillon, it's, it's fortified with the gelatin from the cow feet to make it even more thick, even more gelatinous, even more rich. Okay. So amazing soup. And one more thing you can get from the... Uh, sorry, another thing I would like to mention is the coal fat. Uh, amusing, very uh, amazing part of animal that's often quite neglected uh, in some countries. For example, in Russia we don't use it so much. Here in Bulgaria I saw it is used much more often and it's an amazing thing. It's the underlying like a net of fat. Uh, and you can wrap your lean meat into it to make it more juicy, to make it more flavorful and uh, more moist inside. You and then the liver also with that. Or you can use liver for it, uh, lean meat or like anything that gets usually dry and tough, you can wrap in this. It's like a sausage casing, but it's open flat like a towel. You can wrap it and sear and then finish in the oven if you need to and it will stay very moist, very flavorful, and it's absolutely edible, so you can just cut and eat it. Uh, for the artisan butcher equipment, you will need some uh, butcher knives, cleavers, hooks, uh, meat grinders. Uh, for sure, you'll need to have some protection clothes, like a uh, chainmail glove, for example, because when you work with a very sharp knife and you separate the carcass into pieces, you will have to use it. Uh, sausage stuffers, different, um, uh, meat cutters and other equipment, but basically all you need is the skills, proper clothes and a sharp knife. Yeah. Don't need so much. Another thing is dehydration. Now it can be done really easily with a dehydrator machine. It's quite cheap, so uh, there's uh, no excuse not to get it if you, if you want to have chips. Otherwise you can use the oven uh, with the convection or even on without the convection just go on low temperature and maybe you keep your door slightly open so the air can circulate and doesn't burn your products. And you can dehydrate your chips, you can dehydrate your meats to make a jerky, you can uh, do many things with this. It's an amazing way to save uh, some food for you for later, to save the food and to have a crunchy element later on on your plate if it's part of composed dish. Uh, one funny fact, uh, I was wondering for a long time if jellyfish can be eaten and in um, Asia they have this method that they really use jellyfish, I think it's Japan, I'm, I hope I'm not mistaken. Um, the first they dehydrate it so it becomes really really dry and then they uh, add water to it. The steps are here, steps of dehydration of jellyfish and you can read it later on but basically you can reconstitute it with water and then you use it for the salad. Jellyfish doesn't have any flavor, so it's mostly used just for the texture. Okay, but we'll jump further on. I don't want to waste so much time. Agricultural revolution was the uh, big step that happened with humans. They found uh, some ways to have food more, cost, more reliable. Yeah, Because with meat and fruits, in winter there is no fruits, so you kind of... 
you are on a diet, yeah? And also with the meat, if animals run away, you are starving. So humans were looking for a way to find alternative uh, food that can be with them all the time and that can be stored. And food that can be transported without getting spoiled very fast. So in different countries, they found different types of grains. It was wheat, it was corn, it was uh, potassium. Um, uh, uh, millet and other uh, grains in different parts of the world, but basically this is what changed uh, civilization 10,000 years ago in the area called Fertil Crescent. This is the area where is now Iran, uh, uh, Israel, and um, um, uh, that area, Middle East. And by 7,000 before Christ, before era, uh, agriculture had reached Greece, and then 6,000 years ago, Italy, Eastern Spain, and Central Germany by 5,000 years before our era. It reached Britain. So people start stop moving. They could set up a village. They could stay there um, the whole year. Their diet went really down because you can eat only wheat. You cannot gather so much fruits anymore because you stay in one place. You can't hunt so much because you stay in one place. So, But still, you can have kids and you can have you can keep your grown-ups there alive if you have food which can also pass you the knowledge so it was a big step for humanity uh, transferring uh, changing their diet for grains and from that fact we can learn that the bread was the next uh, artisan food of that time and it's very important until now almost in every country you have one or the other bread on the pictures, you can see the breads that uh, our students made here. Um, many different breads. We, every bread we do here, we do, of course, artisanally by hand, using only rolling pins. And, of course, we use time to time the mixers, dough mixers. Otherwise, it's just going to take too much time to work it out properly. And this is another picture of the variety of breads that uh, our students made here. And you can see the pogaccio bread here on the right side. The bread that uh, we'll, we will make today. I showed you in the beginning of this uh, the bread proven and the bread that we put into the oven. If you missed the first part, please make sure you double check it. So, what are the benefits of making artisan bread? Yeah, because now every moment you can buy it in any shop. So, I pointed out a few, you can for sure you can think about more of them. So you can offer the freshest bread possible. Yeah? If you do artisan bread, you do it at your place or you buy it from uh, the bread maker, the baker, and he will give you the freshest bread. It's one thing. The other thing is the healthier product with less additives. Yeah? You don't need conservatives there, you don't need preservatives there. It's just flour, water, yeast, and or without yeast, depends on the bread, and some flavors like salt, sugar. Uh, and you can be more creative also because you can have different shapes, you can add some extra dried fruit or whatever you like or dried tomatoes or other vegetables uh, you can be free of the market offer you can do what you want basically for the equipment of course you need an oven or bread oven or normal oven or if you are here tandoori you can use tandoori it's the asian way of cooking you can see on the picture below uh, or you can use grill if it's the flat bread you can grill it and um, uh, give it some smoky flavor You'll need rolling pins for sure, you'll need scales and other measuring tools. You'll need the dough mixers, because if you do big batch, doing by hand, uh, it's really nice, but it's going to take a lot of time and you really need the big, strong muscles. So it's not applicable for every person. Uh, and the dough proofers will be nice, especially if you live in a cold climate. Uh, then proving will take more time, so proving machine will be good. And you can even have a flour mill, and we have one here. Um, I'll show you later on. So you can take the grains you want and turn it into the flour and make your own bread from your own grains, which is even more artisan. Uh, another quick thing, by using grains also people found out that you can make alcohol by fermentation. So the beer was um, a thing in the ancient world, it dates back around, sorry there is a mistake, uh, 16th century not 6th century BC. Um, so it was most likely just a surprise, spontaneous fermentation, but people liked it. Uh, we know because it came from the ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia area. It was used in religious ceremonies and 30,000 gallons, gallon is about 4 liters, 3.7 uh, liter, a year was offered to the gods. 
Okay? And of course, we know it's still, uh, now we still have it. So you can do artisan alcohol, not just the beer, the wine, the strong alcohol, but this will require a bit more um, technologies. So I'm not gonna talk much about it for these classes, but basically you can uh, have a restaurant with its own brewery. And from my cities in St. Petersburg, there is one restaurant called uh, Karl and Friedrich. And uh, this brewery with the restaurant inside, it dates back to 18th century. And also I know, for example, in uh, Salzburg, in Austria, there is a very old uh, brewery where monks were brewing the, the beer. And they have snacks also, so you can buy the beer and some snacks. Some wineries here in Bulgaria, there's a lot of wineries. They have amazing wine and they also have some time wine, wine tasting or they have a restaurant nearby where you can eat food while you're tasting the wine. Okay. If, you, if you're talking about the equipment, you can have a mini brew even to make beer at home. You can see on the top picture on your head. Uh, or something more bigger and more uh, stronger like uh, brewing machines. They will take some space in the kitchen, so you'll really need to be dedicated to it. Or you can do non-alcohol brewing beverages like, uh, for example, in Russia we have a drink called kvass, which is like Russian Coca-Cola, and you use bread instead of uh, coca to flavor it. You use rye bread and it's sweet and sour gas, uh, gassy drink. Okay, another thing artisan uh, is the food smoking, yeah? Because taming the fire was a very important step in the evolution, our evolution. And smoke is unquestionably, uh, questionably, sorry, a major flavor category that we have learned to enjoy. Yeah, for many, many generations, smoke becomes smoky food means cooked food, means tasty food for us, and we learn from it. And food could be cooked uh, with hot smoke, if you have a hot smoker in your restaurant, or just flavored with cold smoke, and for that you just need a small smoking gun. So, for the smoking equipment, you can use barbecue, you can use open fire grill, you can use hot smoker, uh, or you can use smoking gun, you can see on the bottom uh, right picture. What is the difference? Yeah, when you do hot smoking, you also apply the temperature from the heat and it cooks the product uh, through. Though if using smoking gun, your product has to be cooked uh, or cured or marinated, so it will be uh, eatable, yeah? Because cold smoking will not cook it, it will just give it the flavor. Also smoking is good because it creates the acidic coating for the food which protects the food from uh, getting more bacteria from the outside area. So it, it works as a little bit like a bacteria protection. And it helps with the food safety. Okay, uh, some of the dishes, we had a dinner here with the students, made by students called Smoke and High Spirits, and we had uh, duck pastrami, smoked duck. Uh, as an amuse, we had some uh, smoked pork belly with a smoked barbecue sauce, and we had uh, some dessert with the persimmons, pomegranates, and smoked white chocolate uh, ganache there. Okay, another artisan thing you can do uh, is the artisan cheese. And here, I didn't take part, but my colleagues, they did the artisan cheese class with students, making different cheese uh, with a specific uh, bacteria strains. And um, um, basically, it was very interesting. You can make your own cheese. You can get what exactly you want. I mean, the amount of uh, moist inside, amount of fat, you can control all the steps. Yeah. So for the milk, you basically, uh, the best is to use raw milk if possible, but also um, they say that uh, posturized, uh, homogenized or homogenized and posturized milk is still okay, but it's not recommended to use uh, UHT ultra, uh, uh, ultra posturized milk because it's not just not gonna make these curds uh, work for you. So for the artisan cheese equipment, it's good if you have the molding uh, and shaping devices, different molds and shapes, draining and ripening boxes and presses, the main things you'll need if you want to make uh, shapes of different cheese. And uh, I'm getting to the end of the presentation. So uh, artisan preserving processes, another thing is fermenting. Yeah, there's many, many ways to ferment your food. And with this uh, way to 
extend its shelf life, which was, I guess, the, the most important part to make your food last much longer so you can eat it in winter when you don't have crop. And uh, there are many of them, there are plenty of them. You can research, you can find, for example, kimchi for the Korea. Um, and it's like one of the main foods they have. Or shiracha sauce, it's also done by fermenting the chili peppers. Or the black garlic, though, it has more uh, caramelization that turns garlic to brown and uh, uh, pops out the sweet part of it. But also it stays for a long time, so it's, I guess it's fermenting. By the way, black garlic came from Korea uh, also, like a kimchi. Uh, it, for a long time it was made there and it was famous for being very healthy and very uh, good for your body. Another way of artisan preserving is to pickle something. So when you're pickling, you're um, adding some kind of acid or a lot of salt and sugar. So you drive out the moisture and you create the environment that is not good for bacteria to survive. You can pickle jerkins, onions, chilies, you can do it with uh, almost anything, and uh, or mushrooms. And another thing is preserving. Yeah? Of course, you can preserve food by canning it. And uh, in our countries, in Bulgaria and Russia, it's a very common thing for grandmothers and mothers to do, to save food for winter by canning it, making jams, making uh, different uh, vegetable sauces, vegetable... Uh, for example, here in Bulgaria, there is an amazing thing called lutenica, which is the uh, roasted peppers with some other vegetables, mm -hmm. uh, like tomato, like onion, like garlic. Um, can be, I guess, different from village to village. Um, they're roasted, then you remove the skin, you cook it all together, and then you can it. Uh, can be like a fine puree or can be chunky, so up to can be also spicy with the chili peppers or can be uh, more mild for uh, people who doesn't like spicy. So this is another great artisan process. You can even create uh, specific textures if you learn from other cultures, uh, using the soy milk, using the tofu, uh, making yuba. Yuba, it's um, a thin film. When you have the soy milk, you warm it up. You know how with a normal milk it creates the skin on the top and the soy milk uh, do, does the same. If you warm it up, it will create the skin. You can take out the skin and uh, dehydrate it. And this can become like a um, crunchy, tender, uh, soy flavored element on your plate. You can make tempe. Tempe is also fermentation with a specific bacteria. You can see on the bottom right picture, white beans are fermented with tempe and it becomes like a cheese kind of cheese structure. Or natto, it's another bacteria that makes, uh, after fermenting, it makes your chickpeas, uh, or the soya beans maybe uh, like sticky, like uh, kind of like cheesy. Uh, another classic way of uh, brining is the Japanese tsukemono. It is used uh, for vegetables and some stone fruits like plums and apricots. And there are two varieties, the one that uh, can be eaten fast in a few days and the other one that can be uh, kept for months. It's usually salted as well as fermented. If you do preservation, uh, artisan preservation, you don't need much. You can use tins and jars that are really uh, easy to get from anywhere. You can also use vacuum machine. This way you can seal and you can extend the shelf life and uh, it's, it's an amazing tool these days. And you can use freezers, you can just freeze yeah, the vegetables or meats that you need for a long time. Other artisan food, yeah, for I think some foods are really stay artisan. And even though we can find some foods from uh, the factories, you can still, um, still more preferable way, more popular way is to have it done by hand. One of them is sushi. Yeah. Yeah. We try to teach our students sushi every generation so they know how to make it. Of course, we're not uh, Japanese profession, uh, professional chefs, but we do as we can. And you can see the pictures, uh, our, on the pictures, our efforts. Um, another thing is getting very popular now is gastrobotanica. It's where the chef goes to the wild forest, to the wild fields, and gather the herbs, the unusual herbs and flowers, and uses them in the dishes. Um, I know there are restaurants like this in France, 
in Russia, I'm following on Instagram this uh, guy, um, this Instagram chef Gastrobotanic. You can see he's really, really good with this, and he makes every season he makes a new dish using different herbs and flowers. And artisanal pastry, yeah, you can always buy a pastry in the shop. There's plenty of pastry done by factory, but still, small pastry shops where people cook by hand, they're more preferable for people most of the time. So you can see, and we try to teach our students pastry as much as possible here also. Okay, so here's the list of used literature, and I would like to finish this presentation now and switch back to my camera. Yeah, do you have any questions so far about the theory part? Or should we move on to, to the making of the bread? Okay, so if you have any questions, you can, there is a chat, there's a icon on the top. You can press it and you can ask questions or you can just unmute your microphone and ask me a question. Uh, it will be very nice. So for now, I am going to make the bread. You have the ready one, but if you want later, you can... Yeah, actually, we, because bread takes a lot of time, so we pre-made one batch before to show you the end result. In the very beginning of this recording, there will be, and you are not here yet, but uh, I took it from the proofer and I had to bake it, otherwise it will overproof. So, but still it is recorded how it, it took proof. And now I'm gonna show you how to make it from scratch, shape it and put it to the proofer and then I'll show you the end result. Okay, so, oops. Okay, everything is all right, sorry. So, the bread is called Pogacha. And I have here the ingredients um, measured and prepped nicely by Chef Yubuta. So, thanks to him. You have the recipe also. The recipes are uploaded, so it's called Pogacha, this bread. So, um, I would like to probably transfer so you can see it better. Can we plug it in? Um, the extender okay so I'm going to use the dough mixer here otherwise I'll do it by hand but we just don't have uh, much time and anyway I think dough mixer is not such a big way out of the artisanal cooking I have here flour um, honey and salt we will use for the plating I'll put it uh, aside I have here sugar, milk, water and oil that we're going to use together with the yeast to make the bread. So let's get started with it. Just make sure if you do it at home or in the rest hand that your milk is room temperature. If it's straight from the fridge you have to warm it up. Um, but don't make it too hot, don't make it over 30 degrees otherwise your yeast might die. And all the liquids can go into the mixing bowl together with the sugar sorry I say all the liquids but actually it's water and milk the sugar goes in and uh, the yeast the yeast is 7 grams I'm starting mixing tell me if you don't hear me well I'll speak louder because the machine makes noise. I'm mixing on a slow speed and uh, I'm going to add also three quarters of the oil. The oil is 120 grams, so basically uh, 80 grams you put inside and 40 grams you leave, you will need it for rolling. So I'll just go by the eye. Like this. So you have all the liquids there mixing. I can increase the speed a bit more. And the next step I would like to do is to add the flour, but I'll give it some time to mix first and then I'll add the flour. And I'll need to wait until the dough will be... Um, we'll start to form the dough, then we're gonna add the salt and mix it really well for gluten to uh, start working. So this bread, it's a very traditional, very artisan Bulgarian bread and it's usually served to 
some important guest of the house, somebody you would like to honor and would like to greet with a lot of respect. I'll show you in India. The interesting thing is, this bread you cannot just buy in the shop. Uh, they just don't sell it. So you either make it by yourself at home, or you have to order it from some small artisan bakery ahead of time so they can bake it for you. Okay. So I think I can start adding flour. Starts to mix. So, can add uh, the flour, whole flour at the same time. And we'll start mixing slowly so it first makes as well without you know throwing out flour. And I'll go a bit faster. So it's the bread is a bit sweet, so we add the sugar inside. We add the salt, the flavor is very balanced. We have sweet and salty. You don't have to be afraid that salt will kill the yeast. I know some bakers, they're kind of really shy with adding salt to the bread um, because they think it will affect the yeast. Basically, if you have a good yeast and a good flour, it should not be a problem. You see now it's, it's forming the dough, but uh, it slows down, the machine slows down. I'm gonna push it a bit the higher speed and it starts to pick up all the bread all the dough from the sides so it forms a bowl i think now is a good time to add the salt just um, i'll use the i have here prepped like a pastry scraper to bring it down from the hook back into the bowl adding the salt here it's nine grams of salt yeah so and it's still gonna work and it's gonna make amazing job so don't be afraid of salt salt is your friend now i can go with a faster speed because i want really to push uh, this dough uh, the flour here that we use is not very strong with gluten gluten is the protein of the flour here yeah? and gluten helps to make the dough more elastic just go a bit up here like this. It makes the dough more elastic and you can roll out and give shapes much easier. But you have to work it out well by hand or by the machine to reach the stage when the elasticity comes out. This is the it, it's called to activate the gluten. And it's gonna take a bit of time and a bit of effort. So the machine here is really valuable. Otherwise you can work by hand, which is also possible. With the students, we'll give them uh, to try to make it by hand. Okay. And it's more fun because you can touch the dough, you can feel how it is nice and soft. It's amazing. So this is the bread that here in Bulgaria we make it for the important guests to greet them. And that's why we decide to make it on the first day to greet you in our country, even virtually. So maybe in the future, if you will be able to come to see us here, we will also make this bread for you and make this bread with you as a tradition of artisan cooking here in this part of the world. I'll go even faster. Because now what's important is just to make sure that the dough is properly mixed. How would you know that uh, the dough is ready? Yeah? It's a good question that you could ask me. But anyway, uh, you see here, it's quite elastic already. I squeeze it and it bumps back, bounces back. But if I take a little piece and I try to pull it, it breaks really easily. It doesn't stretch so much. You see, it breaks like um, like a pudding. If I can say so. By the way, sorry for my English. I'm I'm not a native speaker, but I'm trying to be more 
uh, more clear with it. So it needs more, more workout. This bread is traditionally served with a choice of honey. And in Bulgaria, Bulgaria is a country where we have a lot of different honey. And uh, the honey itself is very good here. So uh, sometimes you can even buy it in like Amazon and, and markets like this. Make sure you'll try it. If you come, for sure we'll give you a try. Uh, bees gather the, the honey from flowers, from trees, from herbs. It's really, really tasty, really natural, really healthy. Today we uh, will serve this bread with a honey. It's called the uh, uh, manok mint. And this is from, this is where, when the, the bees, I'll make it a bit slower. This is when the bees go and gather the, uh, the syrup, the sugars, but not from the flowers on the earth, but from the trees. You know, some trees like linden, they produce kind of a syrup uh, when their, their flowers are uh, at the peak stage. And honey goes on the trees and they eat the syrup and make a very specific flavor, very distinct flavor uh, for the honey. This honey is dark and uh, you can see it's a dark honey. I will show you a bit later on. And when you serve this bread to the guests, you serve it uh, with the honey on one side and with the spice mixture called shahina salt on the other side. So what is shahina salt? Shahina salt basically translates like a colorful or a bright salt. And it's a mixture of salt. Um, there's a plenty of spices. You have fenugreek, you have cumin, you have uh, paprika, you have... Um, savory. Um, savory. Uh, savory. Uh, and can be different from region to region slightly, but this, these are the main ingredients that I mentioned. It's, you can see it here. Also, the color can, can be different from different ingredients. Here, this one is a bit more yellow. You can find the, the shahina salt that's more orange or, or red. So it depends on the ingredients. It's very aromatic, very tasty, and uh, very nice to be eaten with the uh, bread or with some other food. So you serve it as a, with a choice. Some people can, your guest can eat it with honey or with the salt or with both. <laughs> he likes to. Okay, so let's check the dough now. Yeah, that looks good. Oh, you see it's much stretchier. And let's see this piece if it's gonna... Okay, it's getting better, but I think a bit more, maybe a few more minutes of, yeah. Of... Uh, well, it's almost, it's almost making this window. You see it's like uh um, actually that good. that's good let's give it just in case you know okay. uh, one chef i was working with long time ago he said like if you are almost sure but not sure just count to 10 and it's gonna be ready <laughs> it's never too bad to give it 10 more seconds so let's say one <laughs> two three four five Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now we're cadaver. <laughs> okay, should be nice now. Now we'll make two breads from this amount of dough. You can also make one big or two, I can't say small, but medium size basically. Here I'm going to use this wooden plot here to work it out. Just make sure it doesn't have any spices or you know, any crumbs. So let me see this bread. And the goes out. I have a rolling pin behind. Okay. It's all good. Okay, amazing. Amazing. So I'm just going to shape it into the bowl first. And theoretically, you can keep it like this covered for 10 minutes just for the bread to relax, for the gluten to relax before cutting it. Though, 
I would like to proceed further on. Uh, we're gonna break it in two pieces. I want them to be equal so it cooks even time because we're going to bake it in the same time. So, so something like this, cut in two. Here, this one is 420 grams, so I guess the other one is a bit smaller. 395, so I need to equalize it for 405 grams each, more or less. Like, few grams doesn't matter so much, but 20 grams will be, okay, like this is good. 20 grams will be maybe uh, not appropriate. So one bowl will leave on the side, just waiting until I'm done with the first one. Here. I have this leftover oil that I'm going to use now. Okay, the other one is gonna be here. And I have um, this here, the tray. I'm using the baking tray, low sides. I'm using the black silk pad with the, you know what is silk pad, I hope. If not, this is a silicone mat that um, can stand high heat. So you can use it instead of baking paper and use it multiple times. Very useful tool for the kitchen in case you never uh, met it before. I'll talk about the difference between this and the other silk pad. We the have, si there the are silk pads for the bread. And there the are two types. The Sorry? The silk pad is for the bread. No, 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 and somebody, the for the somebody was talking, I think. Anyway, um, I, I brought up my uh, volume higher. Uh, sorry if I didn't hear you, please repeat. So there are two types of silk pots. This, the one that we have is black. It has holes, so the air can, can circulate when you bake something. And another one we have here, uh, it's um, doesn't have holes, so it's, how to say, mon monolith, smooth. Yeah, this is for other things like merengue. You can bake on this one or uh, other desserts. One of the things is that silk pie means uh, silicone mat for pain, which is bread, and silpat means for pot, for the dough, basically. So this is used for regular doughs, those that you don't need to have any air coming in, so there's no proofing in it by itself. Ideally, you're gonna use this for those that are a bit more liquid or more soft, and um, if it's for meringue, as Chef Stas said, that's perfect for this. And for the bread, in this case, we wanna use this, the silpain, okay? Again, pain means bread in French, that can be reused up to a thousand years, not a problem. You want to avoid cutting it like somebody did with us over here because yeah. then it breaks and you have fibers coming out. Eventually this happens, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this is great because you don't have to uh, to grease them. They are, they are, it's perfect for breads. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna use this and the molds. These are about, I think, 18 centimeters or 16 centimeters wide. If you make one big bread, you'll probably need like 21 centimeter. But this is just to give them the round shape. Yeah. You can use the square one if you want. Traditionally, it's like this. Um, okay, this is like a modern technology, this silk paint, but um, you can use baking paper in the same same way. It's just for the bread not to stick to the bottom. This will be up here on the side. If you have a stone and a home, also a baking stone, it can yeah. be used also. Yeah, you can use a baking stone. So. I'll start with this here, the bread. I'll need to oil the surface because just with a thin film, thin layer, uh, for the bread not to stick, because I don't want to add more flour. You know, normally when you uh, fold the bread, you can just, just put a lot of flour on the table, but this way the bread will absorb this flour, it will not be even. So traditionally here, people oil the tabletop and classic oil for Bulgaria is the sunflower oil. Another thing is, I have more oil left. I will brush my rolling pin. Yeah, just also, just slightly. So my target now is to open it to make a circle uh, with a thin layer. See the dough is very smooth, elastic. Just keep, keep uh, oiling, grazing this rolling pin. Doesn't stick. Really easy to work with this if you give it enough time, if you need it enough time to work out the gluten. Check you. Somebody is calling. 
Very important is that time to time you bring up the dough so it doesn't stick so much to the table and uh, because if it sticks so much to the table and you bring it up in the end it will shrink a lot and you will lose the, uh, the, the, the thickness will go, it will go thicker. I hope you all guys feeling well in these days. I'm not sick, I just followed, you know, the wrong pipe. So live off. Okay. So, uh, it can be even thinner, but I don't want to go bigger because we have a certain shape. I think this is perfect. Uh, I'll just grab my knife, one second. Here, you can use like a pizza cutter. If you have, you can use a knife, you can use like a big um, pastry cutter. But I'll just go with the knife to be, you know, as simple as possible. We cut in the middle in half, basically like a cake or pizza. We make, we cut in four first, and then one more time in four. And this shape is expressing, you know, everybody can make it different, it's not a... Uh-huh. So, uh, my Bulgarian colleague tells me that the, sh the idea of the shape is that um, uh, shape can be very different, yeah? Shape can uh, represent a certain uh, town or certain family. So I will show you one or two ways with two doughs, but uh, there are, like in each family, it's, it's kind of like a competition. Everybody is making it slightly different uh, to stand out. So what we do here, we have to pull one slice, we pull it here on the sides to be longer and then fold it one time. Now we're gonna basically make something like a croissant. And uh, one more thing before I'm folding, some people put salt here, some people put um, cheese or can put spices. Yeah, I'll show you another traditional way, just the dough. So I'm folding like this, I'm pulling to make it even thinner and then folding, pulling and folding, pulling and folding. So I have something like a croissant. I can close it, again, shapes can be different, but I would prefer to close it like this to be the shape. So now I have here, good job on the camera. Are you taking it? Or? No, you want me to take it? So, I have this here one ring, so I will I will put here this and with this um, croissants we're gonna fill it up, you'll see. So-called croissants. Yeah, so-called croissants. Just to, you know, this is one uh, name of the shape, I know. So. With the half moons, we'll make one sun, a circle. Or with the half moons, we'll make a full moon, if you want to. Bulgaria, you know, it's a very sunny, very rich with sun country. So sun, it's uh, a perfect shape, perfect image mm -hmm. that you can have. It's actually one of the ancient gods before we become Christians yeah. also. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure this is like, you know, sun was... The sun. god of the Slavic. Yeah. Actually. What was the name of the, um, do you know, do you remember? Uh, of the Bulgarian sun I'm, god? I'm, I'm not, I'm sorry, I can't remember now. Because but. Uh, in old Russia, I think the main god was... Uh, uh, mm, I know Perun, but Perun was uh, commanding the the lightnings and storms. Uh, but the sun, the sun god was. Uh... I'm sorry, I also I also don't remember. So Perun. Was... Ra, I think Ra was the like kind of like Egyptian. <laughs> you guys are Egyptian. Well, you know the whole civilization came from there. 
basically Mesopotamia and the... It's actually, you know, I was explaining in the beginning why people were hunters and gatherers, they had to travel, they cannot stay in one place and that's why they spread all over the world uh, where they could go. But it took like millions of years. I mean, if you follow the evolutionary, evolution, evolutionary concept of things. Okay, last piece here. If they hear water running in the background, it's our ice machine, that's why. I can hear it from here, but I'm just beside it. Yeah, if you hear the water running, it's an ice machine, it's not us going to the toilet. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> sorry for that comment. So this is one, one shape, and uh, I will make the other do another shape. Try to be fast. We still have plenty of time, so... Are you going to show yeah. them something today? Yeah, I'll do the... I think I'll be like another 15 minutes and I'm okay. 15, we take a few so we'll like... minute breaks and then I'll finish with the mise en place okay. with the beef already. Okay, so guys, the idea is now I'll take another like 10, 15 minutes to finish this one and I'll show you the, the finished result. And then we'll have a short break, after which uh, Chef Yu, our program director, will just explain you uh, the preparations for the recipe that he will make the next days. Okay. So I'm opening. This again, trying to be as round as possible. Of course, I'm not that perfect. But like any artisan craft, you have to practice it every day. You know, if you just do it time to time, can't expect to be as good as you know professionals that do it every day. So, it looks pretty good, man. I like working with the dough. There is a thing also that you're either a cook or you're a baker or a pastry chef. There are three different set of skills required for each yeah in this role in this role play game you have to choose your class <laughs> yeah. a wizard a, a warrior or a rogue yeah, yeah. <laughs> or can be uh, very humble like me and be good in all three monk, <laughs> <Okay>, monk. <laughs> humble is the monk okay so again round again cutting in um, eight pieces Like, using knife is not the best way, but at least it's on the wooden board, so it's not gonna dull it so much. But I know many pastry chefs, they like to use their knives. Any questions here for the Instagram live stream, guys, please be welcome to ask. We can try to answer you. Okay, another simple way to uh, fold it would be pretty similar, you just take so one piece, you fold it in half so it's like uh, half wedge and you do again the same, you pull and you close it you pull and you close it, you pull and you roll and again you make this kind of croissant shape, half moon shape but it's gonna look uh, neater And I'm gonna be like this. So like I said, in every family, they do it different way, they give it different shapes. Here I made some small mistake that I cut it uh, slightly different. You see this piece is bigger than this one. So try not to repeat my mistake because now this piece will cook faster than that one. So you have to, if you want to become perfect in this, you have to be uh, very, very accurate what you're doing and anyway if you make a mistake you can always fix it 
If everybody. it's not included with the East, because yeah. then... Well, I mean, <laughs> what I mean is everybody does mistakes, but you have to know how to fix it next time. Because, you know, many students, they get disappointed and they got... If, if it doesn't work for them and for the first time, and they got really uh, demoralized. And what is important is to know that, you know, everybody makes mistakes. What is important is to take, the lesson from take a mistake. lesson from it and know how to fix it next time. And this way, next time it will be better, better, better until it becomes perfect. Okay. Any questions? So if you have any questions, please, I cannot see the chat now because I'm folding, but maybe uh, you can go with the voice. Don't be shy. We're not biting. Maybe you have a similar bread or a different bread but similar tradition in your country you would like to share. Has to be artisan, yeah? Has to be something that people do by hand. I believe in general it's a very interesting topic that we can uh, talk about tomorrow and the day after also is that you have to decide whether it's uh, w when you have to go artisanal where it kind of pays or where you should use the industrial food because sometimes you know you don't have time or sometimes you don't have space for it for example you open a sandwich uh, business yeah would you make your bread yourself or are you gonna buy it from somebody there are benefits on both sides. Okay, so I'm done with this too. And now this should go to the uh, oven, to the proofer, to the proofer first. And this should just double in size. You can see I made exactly the same shapes before the class and you can see in the beginning of this recording uh, how they proofed basically double and now we have that we have it already baked the first batch and I'm going to show you now so here I think it's even better if we just go on a clean surface here yeah, if you maybe just unplug it, unplug it here and uh, let's bring it there just for the moment. Mouse is okay. out. Yeah, perfect. So this was one shape, this was another shape. This one shape, another shape. They're slightly different. You see how much they proved, uh, how nice they are. This is the honey that we will serve it with. The shine salt, one of the types. And the guest can break you a can, piece and dip the... You can break it. Okay, so let me break it for you. Uh, remember the bread when it's just from the oven, it's not. It's wow. better to give it some time to go to room temperature. See how it pulls oh, yeah. into nice pieces, nice strands of dough. See how airy it is, how soft it is. So just break a piece and you go deep into the honey or into the salt. I'll just pick a bit of salt here and. Mm. It's nice and soft. Is it good, uh, chef? <laughs> nice and soft and very tasty. Sorry for my chewing. So this is the result. It's not so easy to make, but yeah, it's quite fast. The it takes you <laughs> all in all maybe one and a half hour with the measuring and uh, shaping and proofing. If it's at home, can be at room temperature, but longer. Time. Yeah, if it's at home, it can prove at room temperature, but depends on also season. Yeah, if it's summer. Faster in the winter might take a few hours, but it's important to proof it. And then you have a really uh, very airy and nice and well proofed bread inside. It's actually called Tomuk Pogacha, which means it's like cotton. It's not something. Maybe you can see. Mm. So it's 
Sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's called Pamuk Pogacha because it's that soft like cotton. Basically, cotton means. You yeah. can see how soft it is and so how. In Bulgarian, it's called Pamuk Pogacha because Pamuk is the cotton. So you can see it's like a oh. cotton material. You get that? No, I didn't. Okay. And this is here, the other one. This is here, another one. You just need to get it out of the hole. Oh, so you see that the bottom of the mat. Here, let me let me flip you guys around a bit. You see the bottom of the mat over here is made so to have air circulate underneath. And if you see the bottom of the bread, Chef Stalo in a few seconds. The bottom of the bread, you can see the shape of the mat in here. You can get closer a bit, so it's gonna be easier for them. Okay. You can actually see the bottom of the bread. You see the little dots? That is here, right? And that allows the air to circulate. Because it's, a, it's, a, it's an open mat, basically, versus the other one. Many chefs will have only the silpat in the kitchen, which is not so bad. It does many things. But if you're going to make bread, seriously, or even at home for yourself, I highly recommend you get this kind of mat, the silpain. P-I-A-N, which means bread in French. They also have mold, the same, sh the, the, the same material, but shaped in different shapes. So you can actually do uh, a loaf bread, you can actually also do, they have baguette mold shaped like this, semi-rigid, which allows the air to go through it. Now, talking about te technology, that's a great advantage because this is reusable. It's easy to wash versus before it used to be for the baguette, for example. Chef Koyan does baguette over here. The cool thing is that this, this map, when you, pull your, when you put your dog on, the, the bread will not spread because of this this surface, the dough will just grow up. It will not spread sidewise. That's why also we have this relief. Yeah. And that's a good technology. It came out in the 70s and it's already 30 years old, but it's used more and more nowadays by, uh, by bakers and chef. And it trickled down to home cooks to do so. Okay, guys, so this is one thing I forgot to include into my presentation. This is another equipment that you might have for the artisan baking. And answering the question to Alberto Martinez, uh, as I told before, this is the Shahina salt. It, it is salt mixed with uh, cumin, paprika, fenugreek, um, savory, and sometimes some more spices, depends on country to country. Uh, sorry, region to region of Bulgaria. It's my computer that you have on the, on the, on the day. Okay. And also it says Shahina salt, but salt is a really, really small part of it. Yeah, it's not that salty at all. It's more lot of flavor, a lot of flavor. It's a seasoning, it's an aromat, it's a seasoning uh, agent or powder. So we are here in Bulgaria. I would like to greet you for coming to Bulgaria. Now we would like to have a short break and reset quickly and Chef, you will prepare you for the next days. Okay, so let's have five minutes. Let's take a 10 minute break. So 10 minutes break. Now it's 1223 three on my uh, watches. So 1233. 12 yes. Her microphone is on, that's why. usually uh, inviting and receiving our guests at home with homemade bread served with this special type of uh, spices, sharana sol. And we usually we have a saying here that uh, if you are welcomed in someone's house, they should meet you on the door with bread and salt. Okay. This kind of our so, so if somebody invites me and uh, uh, I don't see I don't see this bread, then... Oh. Yeah. So if somebody invites me and I don't see the bread, I can, I know that it's something, so, they have something against yeah, me. Yeah? And if, if someone offers you the bread with honey instead of salt, this means that they would uh, require a marriage. Oh. <laughs> so so when we go to, 
when we go to, <laughs> to Dobrich, we better get that bread, huh? Or wedding, or for uh, baptizing of the kids, the salt is uh, replaced with honey. Because it's supposed that the life of the future couple or the small kid uh, who is baptized is supposed to be sweet as the honey. Okay. And the, the receiving of guests and meeting them with salt uh, is a gesture of trust that I share with you uh, our bread and our salt, which in the past, in the ancient times, was the two most important ingredients and uh, life-sustaining issues for the Bulgarians. So it's very, uh, how to say, there is, a, um, there is meaning behind the gesture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not just the food, you know. Yeah, I'll try to explain that also. Yeah. Uh, answering the question of Alberto Martinez, yes, you can buy such a salt already pre-mixed. Yeah, Actually, it. most of the time, like you can have it already pre-mixed. Amazon has like it. Like any uh, spice mixtures, any salt mixtures. Like uh, you can find it in Amazon also, if you are from the other uh, country. You can come by and buy some as a souvenir. I also saw it like souvenirs you yep. have in the in the fields in the glass different colored salts and later on you can just have it in the kitchen as the decoration or use it in cooking okay guys let's have this break and we'll just reset quickly i'll clean up my uh, stuff and uh, then check you will continue so just so guys we'll take a 10 minute break we're going to stop here for today on the instagram account and then uh did you mention the instagram account for them also maybe they want uh, right, to them? mention okay. because you Guys, before we leave, one thing you have to know is that I've been filming the whole time on Instagram. So uh, you can see a different point of view from this Instagram. Check on Culinary Arts Europe. You're going to find us over there and there's a live stream going on. Tomorrow and also later on today and then tomorrow and on Friday, we'll have the same thing happening. Also. So you can see it, two different point of view, both the computer and also via the phone for more or different set of shots. All right. 10 minutes and I'm going to be I'm going to be in. All right. So guys, as I was saying, I'm going to close in today and then uh, we'll, we'll see you later on. Uh, but you can log in again in 10 minutes. We'll start it again so you guys can see us. I have to do a small presentation of what we'll do in the next few days, explaining some of the tools we're going to use. And then tomorrow morning, again, the same thing. We are live at 11 o'clock uh, Varna time. Uh, which is different hours all around the world. Um, right now we're working with uh, partners from Spain, Portugal, Italy, Turkey, France, and us, Bulgaria, for this project. All right. So see us tomorrow morning. See us in 10 minutes, and then again tomorrow morning at 11 Varna time. All right, guys. Ciao.